We have God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we're celebrating the Feast of uh, the Virgin Mary, which is not unheard of in Anglican churches, but it's a little bit uncommon. To tell the truth, the feast actually fell on Thursday, but I transferred it to, to Sunday. And to do so in some circles would be a controversial move because Mary has attracted a lot of controversy and speculation and all kinds of things that people have projected onto her story over the years. In Roman Catholic piety, of course, she is held up very high. She's held to be a model not only for the Christian life, but specifically for the female Christian life. In other words, she has been held up in many generations as the ideal and perfect woman, perpetually virgin and pure, submissive to God's will, and so on. And of course, therein lies the problem. Uh, this kind of idea that Mary is the doormat of God has not sat well in our current generation, and understandably so. But I think to see her that way, to see her as this purely uh, submissive person who just does what God tells her, really misreads her. And take this song, for example, that we have in the gospel today. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Scholars tell us this was not her composition. This was actually a much older song, probably written maybe 200 years before, maybe during the Maccabean Revolt. Now, this was a rebel song. This was the sort of song people would use to rah-rah, get the troops motivated to go out and do guerrilla warfare against the Seleucian army. So this was not a, uh, a gentle song. This was uh, the sort of song that was really meant to kind of get you angry a bit. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. This is sharp language. These are sharp words. So if Mary is not exactly a doormat, if she's a bit of a rebel, if she's not what we've always maybe thought her to be, what is she? The Gospels spend more time talking about her than most other characters besides Jesus himself, so we have a few little snippets of her here and there. We have that wonderful moment, for example, where she ponders all these things in her heart. Uh, we have her at the cross later when Jesus is crucified, and he says to his disciple, uh, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. We have these little stories, little snippets, but we don't really know much about her. So in the medieval age, of course, they attributed all kinds of stories to her. They, they uh, made all these legends about who she was and what she did and what kind of life she had with God. And um, in fact, they also started making art about her. Uh, one of the most famous uh, pieces of this was an icon that supposedly was painted by Luke himself and uh, was taken from the Holy Land to, Constantine, uh, to, uh, to Constantinople. And my wife's giving me a look. It's very, she's an art historian, so it's very dangerous ground for me to talk about icons. But it's pretty difficult to avoid talking about icons when we talk about Mary and our experience of her. Because in some ways, she is this kind of icon that we look at, whether in the textual form of looking at the scripture, whether we're thinking about her and when we encounter her in popular piety, like on the hood of a, of a Trans Am in Los Angeles or, or on a wall somewhere. You know, she's constantly kind of there for us to look at as an object of our reflection. And therefore, I think it's good for us to engage in that way to make our own portrait of Mary. And she can look like whatever you want her to look like. How do you see her? So that's what I want to, to lead us on now. We're gonna do a little imaginative exercise. So I, I'd invite you to, to close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes and take a deep breath. And then another one. Now I want you to imagine a woman with a child. She is seated. The boy, about three, is sitting on her lap. He has a blue ball in his hand. They are content. The air smells like sandalwood. She's wearing a blue dress sandals. There's a flower in her hair. The moon is over her shoulder. In her face is all the love a mother can have for her child. child looks at you too. 
He smiles, a child's smile. But his eyes are old. His eyes pierce into your soul and you feel known. a deep breath. Now open your eyes. Now, I want to hear from you. What did you, what did you see? That was a very brief exercise. I'd invite you sometime to do a much longer version on your own. Just, just imaginatively walk yourself through that scene of seeing Jesus with Mary. And, uh, and, and you can elaborate as much as you like and, and, uh, and so on. But I want to hear what some of you saw when you, when you did this exercise, this brief exercise. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't process it all, but it seemed like it was kind of poetic with the moon over, mm -hmm. over her and the baby. And I think you said the baby had a ball in his hand? Yeah, I was borrowing from some traditional iconography. Yeah, the symbol of the blue ball is, is basically he's holding the whole world. Is, is kind of the, the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the icons have had uh, historically have had incredible power. Um, my my wife could tell you all kinds of wonderful stories, but uh, one that I know of, there's a famous icon called uh, Arle de Guadalupe, and that appeared miraculously in Mexico, supposedly, and uh, and it's 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 withstood. Uh, scientific inquiry, like no one's ever been able to debunk it, but this amazing icon actually uh, was responsible for the conversion of millions of people to Christianity because it combined the iconography of the Indians that were uh, resident in Mexico with Western images of, of Mary. So she appears as an Indian woman in that, in that picture. She has incarnated into their culture and uh, it's a very powerful shrine there too. It's a really neat place to visit. Um, they have all these rose gardens around. <laughs> Myself, which I thought was interesting. I could just felt like I was just looking through Jesus' eyes, but I couldn't visualize myself. So you saw yourself? Oh, you couldn't see yourself? Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Don. It might have more to do with a story I'm reading right now, but I, my immediate vision was of a very poor mother and son who are... Um, who are living in oppression, and the feeling that I had was of just immense, that I wanted to fight for them. I wanted to, I wanted to protect them, and I wanted justice for them. You wanted justice for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cameron. Uh, my imagination wasn't so much going with the blue dress and all that, but it, it was um, an image of um, Mary holding Jesus in her right hand and he's his left hand, and he's maybe three or four, and she has a water pail in the other hand, and she's just either going to or coming from uh, getting water. Interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's funny to imagine um, the domestic life of the Holy Family, right? I mean, presumably Jesus had to go through potty training, right? What was that like? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, um, there, there's, there's this kind of, um, there's something very interesting when you go there with your imagination. Um, there's, a, there's a Zen proverb that says, uh, before enlightenment, we fetch wood and carry water. After enlightenment, we fetch wood and carry water. <laughs> you know, there's... <laughs> I kept seeing this um, sort of like part of a face, like a smile, and like 
it kept sort of interrupting the that image and then I realized it was how my own mother smiled at me when I was a kid that I was imagining. Yeah, ma for many people, the way they get to marry is by imagining their own uh, relationship with their mothers. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, I think, you know, as a community, we have to be, put the caveat on that, that not everyone has a great relationship with their mother. Uh, so, you know, that doesn't always work. I mean, I, I know someone who has a, an amazingly rich spiritual life, but he had a very abusive mother. So for him, I mean, he loves the Virgin Mary, but it, it's, it's not, like, he doesn't look at her as a mother. It's very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm absolutely no good at seeing images of my head, I have to tell you that. <laughs> but um, I think what I was thinking would be the, the tremendous love that Mary would have, but also the sense of awe at this child who seemed to be somehow, have those wise eyes and, and seem to be something more than the average child. <laughs> so, um, and how she would how she would treat that child, you know, knowing as she did that the, the child was special, how she would treat, treat him. And, and um, you know, like I think about the, you don't really hear very much about Jesus. You don't hear anything. You know, it's the one time is when they go to the temple. Um, it's, it looks like they gave Jesus a little bit of more freedom than another child might have had at that age because he could wander off but um, it's also a different culture but then I think about the first miracle of, of Jesus where Mary was there and like the sense I get there is that Mary knew that he was capable of big things but she also knew she could kind of tell him what to do <laughs> so so there, there's this kind of tremendous conflict between being a mother and also recognizing the, the God in Jesus so. Interesting, yeah. I, I think there's also, there's, there's something about how, you know, motherhood itself changes, right? I mean, it's, it's not always that you're sort of caring for this person that you're raising in this one way, but it, it sort of evolves and, yeah, there's something interesting going on there. Mm -hmm. Others, yeah, Jamie. Wearing a blue dress. I very dutifully did all of the visualization, and I looked into the Christ child's eyes, and they were very, very old. There was a sense that he knew a lot, but then he broke out into a little kid grin. He got off his mother's lap, and he was in a park, and he went off and played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesus played, right? I mean, imagine. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a Gnostic gospel that has, a sto has some stories about Jesus as a child. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you have to sort of take any of the Gnostic gospels with a grain of salt, in my humble opinion. But um, there was, um, there's a, a story that he, like, uh, killed this bird and then resurrected it, you know, because he was uh, playing with his ability to, like, resurrect the dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other images to share? An interesting exercise, especially if you find it difficult to do the uh, imagination thing, is just to do a Google image search on the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and you'll see some really interesting stuff. I, I don't just mean, you know, traditional icons in the various formats, uh, but one of my favorites is uh, the Surfing Mary. I didn't, I put it on the leaflet, like, I think a year or two ago on this feast, it, and it's, it's Mary, it's the, in, in, on the beach in, like, Encino, I think, and, and it's a giant mosaic of tile work that a guy did, and it's her surfing a surfboard. Um, it's really awesome. And uh, in fact, actually, it was a bit of, it was graffiti, actually. The, the artist put it up against uh, regulations, and the city came and removed it. And people got so upset that it was reinstalled somewhere else, like that it, it was moved. Um, another one that you see a lot is uh, tattoos. Uh, people will get the Virgin Mary tattooed on their arms and stuff, especially. And, you know, why would be an interesting question to ask a person who does that. Um, there's something about the image itself which seems to have a power of protection for people. Like they, they seem to believe that if they have this on their bodies or on their cars or in their homes, it will protect them with the same kind of spirit that, that Dawn talked about where, you know, it's as though this mother and child are vulnerable but they're sort of protected by something around them, by God or something. Mm -hmm. 
So I think as, as Christians, especially as non-Roman Catholic Christians, as, as Anglicans, we, we have this very interesting relationship with, with Mary because we don't necessarily have to buy into the cult of Mary, right? We don't have to. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't exactly ignore her, that she has this historic place in the Christian faith as well as in the biblical story and so on. And we have to kind of encounter this icon and do something with it do something with this image. And whether that's to try to imitate her life in some way, to have that spirit of quietness that she seems to have, or if you want to see her as a bit of a rebel that way, uh, or her, her kind of motherhood aspect, I don't know. But I think that we can't exactly ignore her. So in the week ahead, I would invite you to think a little bit about Mary and think about your response to her and to the icon that you have in your own mind about who she is and what she was like.